Hey loves, today it's coffee (laughs) o'clock. If you can see me online, I have a sweater on that says it's coffee o'clock and it was a gift to me by one of my good friends. And uh, today you are just going to get to visit with me, my friends. I'm just going to be a talking head and wanted to share some recent, oh, I think I was, I was on the rails for a minute in my life. And because I like to share and help you grow in your own personal growth and development by sharing with you some of my experiences in midlife, I figured today was a really great day and a really great break. And some of these wonderful speakers that I have all lined up for you um, over the next several weeks. So I figured that today was as good a day as any. For us to sit down, have some coffee at coffee o'clock, and sit and chat about what to do when life sends you lemons and you need to make lemonade. So keep listening. Welcome. This is Midlife Crisis to a Centered Life Thriving a podcast that teaches women in midlife to unapologetically stop silencing their dreams and start designing the lives they want to live in. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie, and as a clinical psychologist of the last two decades and a twice-divorced single mother myself, I not only know how hard it can feel heading into midlife, I am living it right here with you. I have taken all the many failed attempts and lessons learned in my own life and combine it with my extensive clinical experience to give you the tools you need to make midlife the best time in your life. No joke. So let's get started. Welcome back everybody. It's really good to just be here with you having a little visit and having a little coffee at coffee o'clock. So I have had uh, a, a little rough skid in recent weeks and I figured I would uh, check in with you. If, if you can't tell in my voice, I am not a hundred percent. I have had a uh, laryngitis bout. And then after that was done, then I had some illness in my house. And so, yeah, we've, uh, it's been a minute (laughs) and I had to postpone a bunch of my, um, interviews because my laryngitis was so bad. Although I did do some kind of on the tail end of that laryngitis. So hopefully, uh, you're hearing more of my wonderful interviewees and not me, the interviewer that sounded like a 20 year smoker when I have not smoked for 20 years or at all really in my adult life. So, uh, anyway, I wanted to check in with you today. I want to know how you're doing. Please be sure that you're liking these podcasts and sharing um, your own experience of what you're hearing, because I want to make sure that I'm getting people on the podcast that you want to hear. Like that is really important to me. Um, I have met so many really interesting people throughout uh, doing this podcast. And this season, if you don't know already, you're going to hear a lot more from these experts because what I'm trying to provide for you is is more expertise, um, more access to things that might be helpful to you as, as women in midlife who are trying to get to that centered life thriving. But today, I just wanted to sit and chat because I was having a minute about uh, my my uncentered life unthriving in the last, um, I don't know, it's been, it, I mean, it started in the summer and it's kind of ebbed and flowed. And um, I talked to you about it actually in the summer, so I'll link in the podcast Um, you know, my episode from season one, when I talked about kind of falling flat and what I was, what I was doing to kind of get myself back together, what was working, what wasn't working. And I wanted to, to share with you today some experience. So I'm wearing this sweater that I have on that says it's coffee o'clock here. 
I'll move my mic. So for those of you on YouTube, you can see it's coffee o'clock. I'm wearing this sweater today. It's a a gift from a a really good friend of mine. And that good friend of mine is going through a really difficult time right now. And it happens to be a difficult time that I have also been through. So um, it's kind of hard, right? When you have been through something yourself, even when you're a psychologist, right? Even when you know like how to, like, I got to keep myself separate from their stuff. It's kind of hard not to relive some of your own experience, right? And that happened to me earlier this summer. I had a friend get really sick. Um, and uh, as part of that process, like all the stuff from taking care of my mom and her cancer in the last three of years of her life and um, watching her pass um, now, you know, gosh, it's, I think, uh, it's almost been 16 years. Yeah, it actually has been 16 years. So, I mean, that was a while ago, but it, it, like, even so, all of that stuff comes up for me, right? As soon as people are going through stuff that I've been through that are friends of mine, um, it, it's different than, um, it's different than when I am in therapy with a client. I do have a lot of training around how I keep myself separate from my clients' issues as a psychologist and how I help guide them through um, their experiences without, you know, reliving my own experiences. I don't, I'm not as adept at that in my own personal life. So in my personal life, especially since I have kind of a small community around me. You know, some of us are more on the uh, extroverted side, some of us more the introverted. I have been more introverted in my personal life, meaning I just have a small group of very intense relationships, mostly because that is one of the ways that I show up best as a psychologist. I'm seeing a lot of people there, and so I need my personal life to kind of be a small community of people. And it's always been like that. I've just, you know, since I was young, just had a group of really good, intense, in-depth friendships um, and relationships and not, you know, a ton of kind of more superficial ones. It's just not my, not my jam. And as part of that, when those relationships start to suffer, well, then, you know, I'm suffering with them. I'm a, I'm a very empathic person that way. And it's been really rough. It's been really rough to watch them go through this. It's been really rough for it all to kind of trigger all the stuff of my own and still show up in my life every day. Like, really, it's it's been kind of brutal. And I was talking to somebody the other day, another, another friend of mine, um, about this and like, you know, what I do is I kind of lean on the friends that are having those difficult times and and talk through like, how are you, how are you handling it, Natalie? Because, you know, they know that those are really um, important relationships to me. And so they know that it affects me. And I was talking to this other friend about it. And one of the things that she has been working on, she's a coach, um, and she's been working on this idea of using story in um, helping her kind of share her work. And she's like, Natalie, you know, this really is at the heart of why you do what you do. You know, you might think about sharing it on your podcast or sharing it in some capacity, writing a blog or something where you're talking about how it is really kind of genuinely the reason you do what you do. Because I think that your listeners want to hear that. And she's not wrong. <laughs> um, I have this this really empathic ability to see things um, from others' perspectives and hold space for, I know what that feels like. And and in the spaces where I know where it, what it feels like, I really want to help people when I have journeyed through it and have gotten to the other side and have gained some wisdom, then it's almost like a compulsion for me to help people in that same way. And so I know with these couple friends, like they're still in it, right? They're in the stuff. They're in their health stuff and, and their crises in their life and their huge life changes. And so um, that my expertise is not is not useful yet, right? It's not gonna it's not gonna make all of that go away. They still have to kind of get through the the meat of it, and I'm showing up in that capacity, but that doesn't feel as rewarding for me. So one of the reasons I created this podcast is because I found myself um, in my early 40s getting divorced for the second time, 
And I've talked about this before, but this was, this came as a real surprise to me. I'm not going to lie to you. And I don't know, you know, how many times you've heard me talk about it, but one of the things that was so surprising to me is that, you know, honestly, when I chose my um, partner, my second husband, I, I was trying to kind of plan for a certain kind of life that I thought I should have. Um, I was making different decisions strategically, like intentionally. I was choosing different people to date that I thought had um, a different kind of reliability and like there was a predictability to what our lives were going to look like. Clearly, that did not happen. And so the big surprise to me was like waking up and realizing when you have no awareness um, how you're participating in your own suffering, your your self-awareness is so poor. It's just like when life hits you and you didn't see it coming, then kind of right after that, what you notice is that you did see parts of it, but you had buried them away from your awareness, right? So there's this, this like way in which you know, you've learned over time to kind of ignore the things you don't want to see and only highlight the things that are fitting in with this idealistic way that you thought things were going. And that experience for me was definitely happening around my second divorce. And so like I had, like I said, strategically, intentionally gone out and dated a certain kind of person thought, you know, I was in a certain kind of a relationship um, and created a life around what I wanted that person to, you know, be. And I started to see red flags, but I quickly and swiftly kind of tucked those away. And I haven't really talked in depth about, you know, all of the reasons why that was happening, but it, I, I thought, you know, maybe I'd share a little bit about that today. And um, it might be helpful to somebody out there in my listenership. And so what, like, for me, what happened early in my life is that my mother and father um, separated when I was like, I think nine years old, maybe eight, maybe it was longer. Um, I'd have to talk to my older siblings to know the exact dates, but it, I, regardless, it was it was pretty early in my life. And uh, one sibling was already in junior college, military college. One older sibling um, went with my dad, and then it was me and my two younger siblings that stayed with my mom during the separation. And we were states apart, um, so my dad moved up to Minnesota. My mom and us were still down in Texas at the time. And um, I learned pretty quick that I needed to step up and I needed to like help my mom with babysitting and like be another adult in the house. And um, even though (laughs) that was really like scary to me, I had to kind of push away the scariness of that. Well, then my parents got back together, right? Um, And brought me, you know, and my other siblings back up to Minnesota. We bought our, you know, place. But my parents' marriage, like, was terrible. Like, terrible. There was a a major codependency. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom, you know, it it was the 80s. And um, he threatened to take, you know, the kids, essentially. He, you know, threatened to take us that were younger um, away from her because he was the one that made the money. Now, I don't know if that would have happened, but it definitely uh, landed, right? So that's kind of the lore. Both my parents have passed away, so you, ca- I can't, like, question them, is this exactly what how it went down? But according to, you know, me and my older siblings who knew a little bit more about the behind the scenes, that's kind of what really drove my mom um, to – stop, you know, the pursuing whatever she was pursuing, leaving my father and to come back up. So I learned starting at like age 10, when they got back together, I was like in fourth grade, right? My daughter is in third grade. So like the idea of my daughter taking care of her two younger siblings right now kind of freaks me out. But that was literally kind of the age when this all started to go down. So I mean, as you put it in perspective, it just like, it boggles the mind, right? 
So <clears throat> when they got back together, it was terrible. They were at each other's throats all the time. And I learned really quick that if I became another parent in the household, that it made the household a little less scary for me because it made um, my parents a little less at each other's throats. So if there was a third parent kind of doing household tasks, making sure that my siblings were taken care of and out of the way, um, there wasn't anything there to be fighting about. But I also learned this really dangerous thing, which was I could see that that wasn't working <laughs> for me, but I could also tuck it away, right? I could also like make the decision that I was going to do it anyway because um, the reduction in conflict was more important than me, essentially, right? And so I started on this, this path that, that honestly lasted all the way up until now in many ways, but I have started to rewrite that narrative considerably since my last marriage, so over the last six years or so. I can kind of put up with things that most don't and can't. In order to keep the peace, I just keep hustling over on the side, kind of doing the work of life in order to reduce the conflict. And that had been happening in spades in my marriage. And I I could see it after we broke up, but I couldn't see it prior. And I, I remember like it was yesterday, a conversation I was having with my older sister. So I had just recently separated from my husband. I had moved in with my sister. Um, my son had moved in with his dad and my little girl and I, she was only three at the time, moved in with my sister temporarily until I could figure out what I was going to do. So I moved out of the house um, and I'm driving with her somewhere. I think she was driving actually. I was in the passenger seat and and we were talking about my dad and how controlling he was. And I was like, he was controlling? And she's like, Natalie, did we grow up in the same family? Like, what are you talking about? Was he controlling? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, she's like, see, this is what I know about you. I know how controlling dad was. Dad got you to do the things that he couldn't get mom to do. And he even would pit the two of you against each other. I hated coming home. She's six years older than me. She's like, I hated coming home because there was always like this weird competition thing happening, but you also were like best friends with our mom because you didn't like that. But dad was like pitting the two of you against each other. It was weird. It was like this weird narrative where dad just wanted things in the household to go a certain way. Mom was still fighting him in some of that stuff and you were picking up that slack. And the fact that you can't see somebody trying to control things is almost disturbing given how smart you are. <laughs> That's like, this is the conversation that went down with my older sister. And I was like, what in the, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And it was really like, she opened my eyes to this whole way that my family system had worked when I was little and how that had translated into this last marriage of mine um, where I was hustling and taking care of all the things to reduce the conflict of addressing what wasn't working for me. And I was just letting that go down in, in, in a way, I mean, it, unbeknownst to me, like it got worse and worse. There were things I knew and there was lots of things I didn't know, um, but I didn't want to know them. But I didn't want to know that I didn't want to know them. I don't know if you're following this. I hope you are because I think that a lot of women go through this. I really do. I think that a lot of us are in spaces where we know something about it doesn't work for us, but we are so internally oppressed to like keep the peace, people please, um, make sure the conflict isn't there. And our own worth is is kind of comprised of this ability to keep the the system going. So in in this case it's a family system both in my marriage and in my youth, but it could even show up at work. Like, you know, you have a really bad boss and you're just letting them be horrible, but you're keeping, you know, everything together on the other side. I think a lot of I've run into a lot of women in my coaching and in my counseling where this is a true fact. And Part of why I had created Learn to Love Your Story is that I, you know, was only a few years away from that and had started the process of really un 
unpacking how much I would like blind myself to that, that kind of control happening in my life. But I had been taught to do it like literally since I was as little as my daughter. Like I'd been taught to do it my whole life. Not only had I been taught to do it, I was like rewarded in a way for doing it that way. Like it, it had a payoff for me most of the time until it didn't, right? Until, you know, that moment when, you know, everything busted, there was no way to not see what was happening. And I had to do something within the context of my, my second marriage by breaking, breaking it off, separating and eventually divorcing. And I share this with you because I want you to understand, hey, first of all, this can happen to me. It can happen to a psychologist who knows all of the underpinnings of why that's happening. These are things I've taught on the podcast about. These are things that I teach in my um, my online courses and in the group coaching that I do. These are, you know, concepts of like having that be in your unawareness is really dangerous because then you're participating on the other side in your own suffering without having that awareness. But here's the thing, like when it blows, then you are aware that you did it. And then you might beat yourself up about that and double down on old ways of doing things. Like for me, it would be doing this hustling, trying to keep the peace um, and take care of all the things over here. So there is no disruption and the other person just gets to do what they're going to do. And I had never put together that I had learned that in the context of my father until my sister was like, you know, my experience of that was coming home and watching that triangulation was gross. It was totally like I was pissed at our parents. They were putting you in the middle, but I totally got why you were in the middle of that and how all of that worked. And I, you know, in hindsight, I think I I, didn't happen during that conversation with my sister, but. I have talked to her about it subsequently, but in hindsight, I was like, oh my gosh, she was one of the biggest advocates for me moving away from home for college. And I was really struggling with that because I was afraid to leave my brother and sister behind. Like I felt like I was their third parent and probably the best of the three parents they had, which was a a sick and wrong statement to make when you're only two and four years older than those two siblings. But I was really having a hard time with that, like moving away from home. Oh, I felt a lot of guilt about it. And my sister was one of the biggest advocates. And I, like after that conversation, kind of I had that insight. And then I went back and talked to her about it. And she's like, oh yeah. Like I was all over, like, you need to get the heck out of that house. Like you, you need to go do things. You're super smart. You're so fun. And you need to go find yourself. And and I knew that wasn't what mom was telling you because mom wanted you to stay. And I knew that wasn't what dad was telling you. Um you know, dad's was all about the money, of course. And so he wanted me to go to, to someplace close because that meant it'd be cheaper and I could stay home. Um, and I went against all of those things and I moved, you know, far enough away that <laughs> it felt like I was, it was a, it was a noxious to get in the car and drive back home. So it wasn't going to happen just because, but it was still a drivable distance away from my home. So, All of this to say, like what my friend and I were talking about was that she can see why a story like that has driven me to to create LearnToLoveYourStory.com, to create the podcast Midlife Crisis to a Centered Life Thriving. She can see now that as part of my healing journey, one of the things that I want to give back is I really want women to stop self-sabotaging and self-betraying because That is literally what my entire life was built on, was self-sabotaging and self-betraying. That's, I, from the get-go, was taught, deny what you need, do these other things, even though it doesn't feel great, because that feels better than the conflict that's going to come up if you don't. And that's what was going down in my family of origin. That was what was happening when I was a little kid and my parents separated. I needed to be that third parent, even though it meant I didn't get to hang out with my friends the same way, even though it meant I had to be responsible and, you know, choose things in the summer that weren't fun, like summer camp, because I needed to stay home and take care of those two kids. It, it, you know, 
I never would have seen that during the experience of it because I was just adapting within my family. But because I didn't see it then, I didn't see that I kept doing that in different ways into my adulthood. And I did it in a big way in my second marriage. And it was devastating for me. And she also, this friend of mine, as I was, you know, telling her about this, she said, and I think it's why you need an outlet like your podcast and learn to love your story when you're going through this other stuff with your friends, because they're not in a place to benefit from your wisdom yet. They are still in their struggle. And you need a population, a listenership like you guys that are ready and willing to hear, oh shit, I've been participating in my own suffering. Yes, I self-sabotage. Yes, I self-betray. Yes, I have an inner mean girl. No, I don't want that continuing to happen. And that was really the mindset I was in after my second divorce. I, I, I just like line in the sand said, forget it. Like we are from this point forward, going to have a different life. I'm done. I am done suffering. I am done certainly participating in my own suffering. And I'm going to, you know, figure out what is it, you know, that was happening in my youth that I didn't see. And I'm going to start asking the uncomfortable questions of the people that are still around. Because like I said, both my parents have passed away um, 16 years ago or so. And different different times, but nine months apart. Um, it, like I wanted to unearth what drove that second marriage to be as devastating for me as it was, and I wanted to rewrite that story and rewrite that narrative. But what I also learned over doing that was. I needed to stop attaching myself to a destination. I needed to stop focusing on, um, I, I've arrived, I've done it all, I've checked all the boxes, and now I have a good life, because that was never going to be good for me. In fact, it was going to be counterproductive <laughs> for me, because I would just not want to get up in the morning. I would not want to get up and schlep through a life that was never arriving at some end point that I wanted. So I really, in you know, the creation of learn to love your story.com, used my own story as the backbone to to identify what are the skills that are really needed to pull yourself out from something like that. Well, self-awareness is, but you can't just be aware of it. You're going to have to have compassion because if you're not kind and understanding, then you're likely to keep doing the same thing. But it isn't just about being aware of it. Now you're going to have to like choose differently. You're going to have to make self-empowered decisions. And that's really hard to do when you're going up against the grain of all the social conditioning that you've ever had from your family and religion and culture and society, blah, blah, blah. Right? So those are the first three courses in my series. And then, of course, what I really ran up against was how depleted I was. I mean, years, 40-some years. I think it was like 43 as I started this journey. 43 years of self-betrayal is a big deal and leaves a big mark on your life. So I had to change how I did self-care radically. And of course, that's my fourth course. And then of course, what I've really learned and and what I'm here today to tell you is it's a rinse repeat cycle of I keep uncovering new things that I'm unaware that I'm doing that participate in my own suffering. Like it's frustrating for me that I can't give wisdom to these couple of friends. You know, and I, if I keep my focus on they're not taking my wisdom yet because they're in their pain then I get depleted and I feel burned out about it. But if I focus my efforts on people like you, my listeners who are ready to hear this and want to take this information, then I feel rejuvenated and I feel good about it. Like that was what this conversation with my friend recently really helped me to see and why I, I decided to share a little bit more in depth kind of what I learned and what really spurred me in my journey um, to 
create Learn to Love Your Story, my courses and my group coaching. Listen, by the way, if you are interested in joining me in group coaching, we are still taking signups right now. And so please go to my website, learntoloveyourstory.com right now and click on work with me, or just go to the notes for the podcast wherever you found it today and click on that work with me link or that group coaching link, because I really want to help women. That's my passion to stop this self-betrayal cycle. It has to end somewhere, right? We have to call it what it is, stop participating in our own suffering, and really step in to a centered life thriving. All right. So I'm interrupting this podcast for one reason only. Let me just ask this question. Are you feeling stuck? Are you feeling kind of blah about your life? You're a woman in midlife, and life is pretty good. I mean, you've got your stuff together. You've ticked all the boxes, but you just don't feel like you're stepping into your prime in the way that you'd really like to. And you certainly don't want to go down the road of having a midlife crisis in order to figure all of this out. So if that's you, then my 20-week group coaching program is for you. And guess what? I'm opening it up in 2024. So that's why I'm interrupting this podcast today, because I want to personally invite you to participate in this with me. Now, 20 weeks seems like a big commitment. I get it, but I'm here to help you in 2024. I want you to reach your goals. I want you to really design the life that you want to be living. That is my passion. And it's what the 20 week program does. And don't just believe me here. I want you to listen to some of the testimonials of other women who have been through this program. To go through an actual curriculum of videos and um, thoughtful process of meditation and self-awareness and giving myself self-compassion yeah. also the probably the biggest thing i gained from this was i now have self-respect i don't feel that i need to be that person for everybody else and i can take care of me and not feel guilty and i can look back at my story and not feel guilty just the self-awareness the self-acceptance and i really found the curriculum incredibly helpful for guiding me through that process. I learned how to speak my truth. I learned how to listen to myself. And I learned how to, in a confrontational situation or a painful situation, take care of my needs. It just opened up some doors for me to see things more clearly and respect myself more. Now, doesn't that sound like something that you want to be doing? Now, remember, go to learntoloveyourstory.com right now, and you too can sign up for your complimentary call with me. All you have to do is click on work with me and book that complimentary call, or you can head over to resources and read a little bit more about the various programs that I have. I can't wait to have you be part of this in 2024. So happy new year to you. And let's get you into that centered life thriving. Because I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Minnesota, I have to make sure at the end of each of these episodes that I give you the disclaimer that none of the material that I talk about in these podcasts is meant to replace any kind of therapy or formal medical or mental health treatment. And in fact, anything that I offer on my website, my coaching programs, any kind of psychoeducational materials that I release are not a replacement for that level of care. So just take that into account when you listen. This is information for you, and hopefully you find it of value, both as an educational tool and for your entertainment. And I also want to mention that if anyone you know is in a mental health crisis, needs additional help, I always include these two crisis resources. They're available to anybody. Pick up the phone and dial 988 for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And you can always visit their website at suicidepreventionlifeline.org.
Additionally, there's actually a crisis text line. So if you're not somebody that likes to pick up the phone, text H-O-M-E, HOME, to 741-741. To the crisis text line. And you can find them online at crisistextline.org. Thank you for listening to my podcast, and I hope that you like and follow me wherever you get your podcasts, and maybe consider leaving me a review. It always helps me to keep this podcast relevant when I know what you want to hear about.